Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video on DNA. Before you watch this video, make sure you're confident with animal, plant and bacterial cells and specialised animal cells. I've got videos on both of those things earlier in this playlist if you need. In this video, we will be looking at what DNA is, its structure, how DNA is replicated, how to extract DNA from some fruit, and finally, we'll look at the idea of chromosomes. DNA. DNA is a natural polymer that contains the instructions to make each different living organism. Okay? Now, by this word polymer, we mean a chain molecule. So you can imagine it a bit like a string of smaller molecules strung together into one much bigger molecule. And we'll look in a bit more detail on the next couple of slides about exactly what that polymer shape looks like. Now, it contains the instructions to make each organism. And no two organisms are identical because we've all got slightly different DNA, except for um, identical twins, of course. Now, um, for example, you and I, um, we look slightly different to each other because we've got slightly different DNA. So we're, we're made from slightly different instructions. Whereas you and a spider look very different from each other because you've got very different DNA. So you're made with very different instructions. Now, DNA is found in the nucleus of plant and animal cells and the cytoplasm of bacterial cells. Often when we talk about G DNA, we talk about genes. So a gene is a section of DNA that contains the code, the instructions, to produce a single protein. That's a really important definition. Often when I ask students what a gene is, they talk in kind of vague terms about it being something you get from your parents or something that controls what you are. Both of those are kind of true, but they're not detailed enough for a scientific answer. So we want to say that a gene is a section of DNA that contains the code or the instructions to produce a single protein. Now, human DNA contains tw about, roughly, 20,000 different genes, which means our bodies can make about 20,000 different proteins. And the exact structure and numbers of all those proteins combine together to produce the glorious creatures um, that we are. Now, we also often talk in the context of DNA, we often talk about the idea of a genome as well. The genome is the total of all of the DNA in an organism. So what about the structure of DNA? The first thing to talk about is its shape, which we describe as a double helix. The double part of the double helix means that the DNA is made up of two separate strands. And we can see that on the diagram here. So we can see how there's one strand there curving around like that. And we've got another strand here curving around there. Okay. The helix part means that the shape is twisted. So we can think of it as a ladder that's been twisted around. And that is our double helix structure. The second thing to note is that we've got these four chemicals called bases. Now, the bases in the DNA are the rungs of the ladder going across here like that. Now, these are made of pairs of bases that are matching up, and we'll talk in a second about how they match up. But the four bases are called adenine, which is A, thymine, which is T, cytosine, which is C, and guanine, which is G. Now, it's nice if you can remember the whole uh, the full names for them. But if you're um, feeling a bit desperate in the exam, just the letters is fine. They will always give you full marks just for stating the letters. Now, the important thing about the bases is that they pair up in what we call a complementary fashion. So we have these complementary base pairs. Now, you would have last seen this word complementary in the context of the lock and key mechanism for enzymes. Now, when we talk about the lock and key mechanism, we talk about how the substrate and the active site on the enzyme have complementary shapes. That means they have shapes that slot together. Um, it's the same thing with our um, bases. They have kind of matching shapes. So what we find is that A can pair up with T because the shape of an A and the shape of a T slot together. And equally, the cytosine and guanine, the Cs and Gs, they also have shapes that slot together. And so they can pair up with each other. And we can see that here. We can see how C is pairing with G. We can see how G down here is pairing with C. We can see here how T pairs with A and here how A pairs with T. And those are the only way around the pairings can work. So, for example, C 
cannot pair with thymine, it can't pair with adenine, and it can't even pair with another cytosine. You know, thymine here, it can't pair with cytosine, it can't pair with guanine, and it can't even pair with another, with another thymine. It can only pair with an A. And so that's our complementary base pairing. Now, the base pairing works because of hydrogen bonds. So what we say is that the two strands are held together by these weak types of bonds called hydrogen bonds. And if you have a look at the diagram, the hydrogen bonds are represented by these dotted lines. And you can see that they've got different numbers of hydrogen bonds. So C and G, they each have three hydrogen bonds, which is why they can pair up with each other. T and A have two hydrogen bonds, which is why they can pair up with each other. A can't pair with C because you've got different numbers of hydrogen bonds, so it doesn't work nicely. You might ask yourself, well, how come C can't pair with another C? The reason why is because when you try and pair them up, the positions of those hydrogen bonds are in the wrong place for them to actually slot together nicely. Now, importantly, because these hydrogen bonds are weak, that enables the molecules to be unzipped. You can literally peel the two strands apart, um, and that's really important for the way DNA is actually used, which you'll learn about in some detail if you're doing separate sciences biology. Now, the last thing to mention is that the strands uh, the, uh, of, of the DNA um, going down, they have this backbone made out of sugar and phosphate molecules in this alternating pattern. So if we look at the diagram, the circles are the phosphate. So P for phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, all the way down and so on. Now, DNA is a very important molecule. One of the reasons why it's um, so important is because it is able to replicate itself. It's one of very few molecules that can make copies of itself. Um, and it works like this. So the first thing that happens is that the weak hydrogen bonds between the two strands mean that the two strands can peel apart like this. So you see the hydrogen bonds have gone and the two strands have separated apart. Now, new DNA strands can build up opposite the separated strands. So for example, if I was this C here, a guanine can come along and pair up like that. The T can pair up with an A, the A can pair with a T, the G can pair with a C, the C can pair with a G, and the T can pair with an A. And then if we do the same on the opposite strand, the G pairs with a C here, the A pairs with a T, the T pairs with A, the C pairs with a G, G pairs with C, and A pairs with T. And because of the way the complementary base pairing works, this means that both of these copies will be identical to the original molecule that we had in the first place. So if we look here, we've got CG, CG, and on our original one, we had CG. If we look here, TA, on the second one, also TA, and that's the same as what our original one was. So this is a really clever thing. This is why DNA has found such wide using living things, because it can make copies of itself. Now, a really interesting practical you might have done is to extract DNA from fruit. This is one that gets, um, it's not a core practical, but it does get asked about quite often in exams. Now, the first step in this is to take a sample of fruit. Um, I often use bananas, but you might use strawberries, kiwis, things like that. You could even do this with vegetables, you know, like peas and beans and that kind of thing. So what you do is you get your sample of fruit and you mash it up. And what that does is that just increases the surface area so that more of the DNA can be extracted. The second thing we do is we mix our mashed up fruit with some water, some washing up liquid and some salt. Now, we've got a couple of things happening here. The washing up liquid dissolves the cell membranes and that allows the DNA to be released from the cells. And the salt helps to make the DNA clump together. Now, the next thing is that we then place the mixture in a water bath at 60 degrees Celsius for about 15 minutes. And that just speeds up that process of dissolving those cell membranes um, and making the DNA clump together. The last thing we might do is then add some protease enzymes to digest the proteins 
that are around the DNA and that helps the DNA to be released um, uh, from its kind of stored form. Then what we do is we filter the mixture um, and what that does is that just removes the solid fruit matter. So you can see that here, you can see all the all the kind of solid lumpy bits of fruit goo are left behind in the filter. And here we have our filtrate containing our pureish DNA solution. The next thing we do is we um, very, very carefully, and this is probably the hardest step, very carefully we pour in some ice cold ethanol. Um, and we, we try and do it at an angle like that to stop the water and the ethanol from mixing too much. And the reason we do this is because DNA, although it's soluble in water, it is insoluble in ethanol. And if we do this right, and it is a hard step to do, but if we do it right, we get a layer of white DNA forming where the ethanol and the water meet. And that is a precipitate of DNA. So you can see that here. You can see there we've got our ethanol layer. The lower blue part is the water layer. And there, that white bit, that is our precipitated DNA. OK, so the last thing to look at in this video is the idea of chromosomes. A chromosome is a large molecule of tightly coiled DNA. And we find them in the nucleus of plant and animal cells. The chromosomes are tightly coiled just because that saves on space. Uh, it makes them easier to store that way. And if we look at the diagram here, we can see the chromosomes from a human cell. And if we look, there are a couple of things uh, to point out. Thing number one is that the chromosomes come in pairs. We're going to talk more about that later. And the second thing is that they vary a lot in size. So we've got some really big chromosomes like chromosome one and two that contain many, many genes. And we also have much smaller chromosomes like chromosome 21 that contain far fewer genes. Now, you'll notice in that diagram that all those chromosomes are paired up. And the reason why is because these chromosomes come from a diploid cell. A diploid cell is a cell that contains paired chromosomes. And the reason why they're paired is because of the way that sexual reproduction works. Um, so with e any given pair, one chromosome in the pair comes from the male parent and the other chromosome in the pair comes from the female parent. And we'll talk more about that a bit later on this slide. Um, it's worth noting also that only one of the chromosomes doesn't come in a pair um, and that is the sex chromosomes X and Y. So if you are male, you will have two separate sex chromosomes rather than a pair of sex chromosomes. If you are female, you will still have a pair there and that will be the two X's. Now, in humans, our diploid cells, um, like the one on the right, contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, which is 46 chromosomes in total. And that differs between different animal and different plant species. So some, some animals and plants have many more pairs of chromosomes. Some have many fewer. Now, importantly, in a pair, the chromosomes in a pair contain the same genes, but they may have different versions of those genes. And we call the different versions of a gene an allele. So we can say they might have different alleles of each gene. We'll talk more about that in the genetics video later on in this playlist. Almost all of your cells are diploid. Not all of them, but almost all. So your skin cells, your white blood cells, your muscle cells, your um, you know, brain cells, all your other nerve cells, those are all examples of diploid cells. However, there are also cells that are haploid. Now, a haploid cell is a cell that contains only single or unpaired chromosomes. And the only haploid cells in the body are the sex cells, the eggs in females and the sperm cells in males. So in these haploid cells in humans, that contain, they contain 23 single chromosomes, so just 23 total, rather than the 46 of a diploid cell. Now, the reason why is so that when the 23 chromosomes from the egg and the 23 chromosomes from the sperm combine during fertilization, it then forms a diploid zygote that can then multiply and grow the glorious creatures that you are. OK, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.